Who can forget Dino, the lovable pet Dogosaurus on the Flintstones? His enthusiastic leap and sloppy kisses when Fred got home made us laugh every time. There was a giant dinosaur earth mover that Fred operated at the quarry all day before sliding down its tail, shouting his well-known and highly copyrighted catchphrase as the whistle or bird blew to mark the end of another workday. And then there was Fred's lawnmower, the garbage disposal, and the weird can opener. All dinosaurs? It was silly. We all knew that dinosaurs couldn't do all those things. That was just funny cartoon stuff, right? Did we all know that the dinosaurs shouldn't be in bedrock at all? Apparently not. Welcome to the Maybe Files, where nostalgia gets weird. that loud mouth Fred Flintstone. When's a potato peeler get a coffee break around here? The Flintstones, a modern Stone Age family. Even if you didn't catch it in its original run, you probably know Fred, Wilma, Barney, and Betty. For 65 years, they've been everywhere. Reruns and syndication and merchandising that's still yabba dabba doing just fine. This silly, ridiculous, and hilariously inaccurate version of the Stone Age was comedy gold. So what could possibly be sketchy about Fred Flintstone beyond his antics with Barney? What if this classic cartoon planted an idea in millions of kids that still stuck decades later? This isn't Fred's fault, or Hanna-Barbera's. Nature abhors a vacuum, and if there's a void, something will always fill it. What happens when the thing missing from elementary school lessons gets replaced by Saturday morning cartoons? Ask a silly question, get a silly answer. The ribs will be done in just a few minutes. You know, I was just thinking. I have a kitchen full of the latest gadgets, and here I am out in the yard cooking the way they did a hundred years ago. Before Bedrock was full of dinosaurs, it borrowed something surprising from 1950s television. Created by William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, The Flintstones premiered on ABC in 1960 the first ever animated series to air in primetime. And it was clearly modeled after the live action sitcom, The Honeymooners. Jackie Gleason. The Honeymooners. Alice, come home. Alice. Hey, that healthy boy. Come on. Something to tell you, some news that you won't believe. Fred and Wilma Flintstone were a working class couple, just like Ralph and Alice Cramden. Barney and Betty Rubble? They were Ed Norton and Trixie, the loyal neighbors, always caught up in Fred or Ralph's get rich quick schemes. It was basically 1960s America, just with dinosaurs picking up the slack. And not a single OSHA violation in sight. They sure work hard, don't they, Barney? Yeah? I hate to see them work so hard. Yeah, me too. Uh, let's go around back where we can't see them. The show ran for six seasons and became a massive hit. Make no mistake, this was not a show for kids. It was written for adults, modeled after an adult show, and the advertisers were not targeting kids. Gee, why do wives always have to call their husbands at work? I'm glad you and I work together, Hazel. <laughs> yes, Lloyd. I love you, sweetheart. Honestly, I do. You're the greatest. After the introduction of Pebbles and Bam Bam, the show took on a more family-friendly feel. It ran in prime time through 1966. Then, in 1967, the reruns moved to Saturday mornings. Over the next few decades, the show transformed from adult satire into a kid's merchandising empire. When the Flintstones moved to Saturday mornings, it wasn't just a rerun slot. Suddenly, a show written for adults was reintroduced as children's programming. And that shift may have planted ideas that would long outlast the laughs. <laughs> No one's gonna hate You don't hate me or stuff like that, do you, Wilma? How can I? You're the same stubborn, unthinking, quick-tempered mule I loved and married. Oh, Wilma, that's the nicest thing you ever said to me. 
1963, Bedrock got a new resident, and it changed everything. It's true, folks. The Flintstones are gonna have a baby. And I want everybody in the whole wide world to know it. When the Flintstones began, it was never meant for kids. It aired in the evening. It tackled adult topics. But all that changed with the arrival of Pebbles Flintstone. A girl? Well, well, she's beautiful. She looks just like you. Pebble off the old Flintstone. What a wonderful name. Pebbles Flintstone. Papa, Papa, Goo. Then Bam Bam came along a year later, and suddenly Bedrock had babies and a booming new audience. While the characters became parents on screen, the real goal may have been to capture a new generation of viewers off screen. And because I'm very big with kids, we're coming on earlier at 7.30, 6.30 Central Time. Executives decided that Pebbles would be a girl because they could sell a whole lot of dolls. The toys were in development before Pebbles even appeared on screen. With kids tuning in, the merchandise machine kicked into high gear. Dolls, lunchboxes, books, and board games. In the 1970s, the franchise just kept going. Pebbles and Bam Bam got their own show on Saturday morning, and Pebbles cereal was introduced. The original reruns were pretty constant in the afternoon. Don't get me started on the 80s. There were some strange reboots. Then, a feature film in 1994. So where are we? A silly cartoon with a fanciful premise, originally aimed at adults, but later shifted to a younger audience. Decades of syndicated reruns, new shows, movies, and merchandising. All pretty normal. Not much to see here, right? But what if all that kid-focused fun planted something in our heads? An idea that still lodged there a lifetime later. Oh boy, here we go again. Well, as long as it makes the kids happy. Click, 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 click. Even without knowing what wiped out the dinosaurs, 1960s scientists knew the when. Above a certain layer of rock, the dinosaur fossils just stop. By studying those rock layers and using radiometric dating to measure their age, paleontologists could pinpoint the moment in Earth's history when dinosaurs disappeared. Make no mistake, by 1960, the geological and paleontological science was already rock solid, and yet, a 2015 YouGov survey showed that 14% of Americans said humans and dinosaurs definitely lived together, 27% said probably, and 16% were unsure. <laughs> Stop begging, Dino. If Daddy's not home in five minutes, you'll get his hat. So here's where it gets surprising. That means 41% surveyed believe or lean toward believing that humans and dinosaurs coexisted. That's four in 10 people. That's not a typo, 41%. From a scientific standpoint, it's completely impossible that dinosaurs and humans lived together. Dinosaurs disappeared about 66 million years ago. Hello, I'm back. You took the words right out of my mouth, Dino. And the first human ancestors didn't show up until roughly 60 million years later. But that was definitely not the story being told on lunchboxes. So, if the science is that clear, how did so many people grow up with a completely different version of prehistory? We will continue our discussion of Darwin's theory of the descent of man. Darwin's theory tells us that man evolved from a lower order of animals, from the first wiggly protozoa here in the sea, to the ape, and finally, to man. Why didn't more people know the truth? Evolution was quietly erased from American classrooms. I hereby place you under arrest. 
1925, high school teacher John Scopes went on trial in Tennessee for teaching evolution. The Scopes Monkey Trial became a full-blown media circus, drawing national headlines and pitting modern science against religious traditionalism. <laughs> Pushing that baby carriage. Yes, isn't that darling? <laughs> Ape! Oh, help! Help! Lose Ape! Somebody call the keeper! Help! Rather than fight the cultural backlash, textbook publishers across the country silently watered down or removed Darwin, evolution by natural selection, and even the age of the earth from most school science textbooks. What are you trying to prove anyway? Rach, I'm not trying to prove anything. All I want to do is teach my students that man just wasn't planted here like a geranium in a flower pot. A landmark 1979 study by Gerald Skoog found that from 1900 to 1960, many biology textbooks either skipped Darwin entirely or reduced evolution to vague phrases like change over time. Even after the U.S. pushed to improve science education after Sputnik, the damage was done. The space race may have boosted physics and math, but evolution stayed on the back shelf. Teachers avoided the topic altogether, worried about complaints from parents or administrators. If you were in elementary school in the 60s and 70s, chances are you never learned that dinosaurs and humans were separated by more than 60 million years. And into that silence walked Fred Flintstone. It is the case. The language of the law is clear, Your Honor. We do not need experts to question the validity of a law that is already on the books. Well, what do you need? A gallows to hang him from? Oh, uh, you mean you're a little short, Fred? Uh, let me put it this way, Bond. If a war were declared tomorrow, I wouldn't have enough money to buy a paper to find out who's fighting. These automatic dishwashers are wonderful. You just push the button your work is done. Not for me it ain't, man. Did you ever see such a stack of dirty dishes? When classrooms left out evolution and prehistoric timelines, kids learned about dinosaurs from a very different source, their toys and cartoons. In the Flintstones, dinosaurs weren't the long extinct creatures of science. They were pets, co-workers, and kitchen appliances cheerful little helpers that made prehistoric life feel like a sitcom suburb. Psychologists say children think of the world in purpose-driven terms, assuming that things exist for a reason. I could use a new washing machine. Look at this one. It's on its last legs. Close the lid. That air is cold after you've been in the water. So if your garbage disposal is a dinosaur, and lawnmower is too, maybe dinosaurs were made to help humans. It's a kind of truth you don't remember learning, but it sticks anyway. And it doesn't just fade when you grow up. We filed it away under how the world works. And those lessons got reinforced over and over by breakfast cereal, plastic toys, coloring books, and decades of TV reruns. This wasn't intentional. The Flintstones just did what cartoons do, make the world funny, familiar, and simple. They didn't deny science, they just left it out. Anywhere we go is all right with me, Fred, as long as we two are together. <laughs> Excuse me, I mean we three. <laughs> no, no, not Fred. How about that, gang? Hey, Barney, look at the girls. Can't take a little excitement. <laughs> Takes a man for danger, huh, Barney? <laughs> In 1960s television, evolution was a touchy subject at best. And in a country where schools and textbooks were already dodging the topic of evolution, that silence was enough to fill the gap. Once the bedrock version was baked into our brains, it became harder to unlearn. And that's the thing about childhood lessons. They don't stay in childhood. Psychologists remind us that once an idea becomes part of our mental building blocks, it shapes how we see the world well into adulthood. The Flintstones helped construct a myth that many of us believed in for generations. Okay, baby, let's chuck them in a... Hey, you want me to lob them or you want mustard on them? Uh, mix them up. Okay, coach. The Flintstones didn't mean to mislead anyone. 
It was funny and clever, without a doubt a cultural icon. But it stumbled into an educational hole and unintentionally filled it with humor and science that had already been disproven. When you put all the pieces together, you don't just get a funny misunderstanding. Got any beefs, Mike? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> you get an incorrect story we taught ourselves and then repeated for generations. So what do we do with this myth that's been fossilized in our collective memory? Maybe it's time to dig up the truth. That's it for this file. We're classifying it as a sketchy cartoon. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and click on the bell so that you don't miss what we uncover next. Thanks for watching. Please join us next time on The Maybe Files. Now you see why I'm smarter than the average Brett Flintstone boo. <laughs> the fastest way I know to get a picnic basket. Fred, the basket's gone. Oh, it figures.